Christian Parenting. Welcome to the Christian Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Steph Thurling. I'm the Executive Director of Christian Parenting, a mom of three, and I am so glad that you're here. This is a place where you can bring your real self, no matter what that looks like today, and be given the space, resources, and encouragement you need to set aside perfection and grow into the perfectly imperfect parent God made you to be. Are you searching for the perfect gifts to celebrate the special moms, dads, and grads in your life? We are so excited about the Christian Parenting Moms, Dads, and Grads gift guide that has something for everyone. Whether you're honoring a new mom, a seasoned dad, or a recent grad, we've got you covered with thoughtful and meaningful gift ideas. Inside this gift guide, you will find some of our absolute favorite resources. From Bibles and study tools to inspiring books or fun gift boxes, you are guaranteed to find something special for the most important people on your gift list this spring. You can visit christianparenting.org to get your free Moms, Dads, and Grads gift guide today. Did you know that Christian Parenting has an entire online store filled with resources created to help you confidently raise your kids to follow Jesus? And today, we want to offer our podcast listeners a special 15% off discount when you use the coupon code PODCAST2024 at checkout. Our Christian Parenting store is filled with products for both parents and kids. These resources will help you pray for your kids, walk through life's ups and downs, and develop great faith habits at home. We have everything from prayer journals for parents, family discipleship tools and activities, and a variety of books. We also have products just for your kids like devotionals and scripture-based cards to stick in their backpacks. We truly consider it an honor to provide you and your family the resources you need to build a strong faith foundation. So you can visit christianparenting.org slash store to see everything that is available. And make sure you use the coupon code PODCAST2024 at checkout to get 15% off your order. So every now and then, I really like to focus in on marriage on this podcast because marriage is the foundation of your family and your parenting, but it's really easily overlooked because we get so busy with kids and work and life and all of the things. So today I am joined by Arlene Pelican, who is a top marriage and parenting author and speaker. She's host of the Happy Home podcast and author of several books, including 31 Days to a Happy Husband and 31 Days to Becoming a Happier Wife. We all know that marriage can be hard and that the state of marriage today is changing. Fewer young adults are getting married and more and more are moving in together. So today, Arlene and I dive into marriage. We talk about the importance of long-term thinking and making decisions that will benefit our marriages in the long run. The importance of modeling a healthy marriage for our children and having open conversations about what marriage really looks like. Make sure you listen all the way through because Arlene shares practical tips for busy parents to strengthen their marriage, including daily connection, weekly dates, and regular getaways. You're going to love Arlene. Enjoy. Hi, Arlene. I'm so glad to have you here. It's so much fun to be here, Steph. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for being on. We are talking all about marriage today, which I'm really excited to get into. Um, But before we begin, I like to get to know my guests a little bit. So we could start with my two regular questions, which I prepped you for. So first, can you tell us about you and your family? And then can you use that one word or phrase to describe your family? Yeah, so my family, they are my people, as all of us would say about all of our family. So I guess that is not that special. Um, My husband's name is James. Uh, We have three kids. We go boy, girl, girl. Ethan is in college. Noelle is in high school. She's a senior. And Lucy is a freshman, uh, also in high school. And we're a very like, let's do this together kind of family. Like when my kids were in martial arts, it was, oh, if you enroll your three kids, like they were all in elementary school, like Lucy was like five. And and they were like, if you enroll your kids, like you parents, you can join them too. So we were the two adults in the back of like the martial arts room, like joining because it was free. And then, you know, obviously all the other parents are sitting watching their kids. It was very humorous. So we did like five years of martial arts together. So, and we love to read and my kids listen to podcasts 
podcasts and we we like to travel and all you know all sorts they all have all varied kinds of interests so my my phrase is that we are different but happy <laughs> so we are different but happy and what i mean by that is like our kids don't have phones um you know like in high school they didn't have phones they don't have social media they don't have video games we live in san diego uh, they go to public school so we are very used to being that different family like oh yeah go you know text lucy's mom because lucy doesn't have a phone or whatever mm -hmm. so we're different but we're very happy like we enjoy this difference very much oh my gosh i love that okay so my middle son does karate yes and i'm laughing because i'm world. imagining I my husband you imagine? and i in the back I'll have to later. I will I will send you a photograph later and you will laugh. <laughs> I, I'm impressed though because so my daughter is a dancer and the other day I watched one of her dances so many times I was like, hey, do I have it memorized? I was doing yes, it to her music totally. and I kid you not, my hips hurt the next day. Right? I was like, I'm sore. <laughs> right. <laughs> I work out a lot, but I did this dance one time and I'm sore. So I can't imagine doing martial arts. There were so many times, Steph, that we we're like, we should quit because we are so sore and like our body hurts and we're not used to being twisted in that way. So there were many times where like, we really need to tap out. I don't know. I think that's good for you. That's amazing. I'm impressed. Very impressed. And I'm impressed that your kids don't have phones and all the things. I think that's really incredible. Yeah. That's yeah, hard. my senior is at the point where, you know, we've talked about like, do you want to get social media? Do you want to get a smartphone? Blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, I really want to wait until she wants to wait until all her AP exams are over because she knows that will be kind of like the switch of, hey, I, I really want to stay focused. And why would I like introduce this thing right now? And, and sh they've really been able to choose it, which has been really great. Wow. I feel like we need to have a whole conversation we, about that. We, we'll, have to, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back. We can come back and visit How that. How do we get a kid who's focused <laughs> like that? <laughs> like, what can, are the secrets? We can. I can help you reverse engineer this. I really can. Wow. That's the book Parents Rising. I will help you reverse engineer that. That's amazing. It's, it's I totally love that. doable. Yeah. Okay. Well, so then going off that, maybe this will tie into it. I don't yeah. know. What is the one thing that you want every parent to know? You know, I want you to know that you that we can shoot for the long term instead of the short term. So many times it's like, oh, I'm just going to give you this lollipop because you've asked me 10 times for this lollipop, so take the lollipop. But I, if I'm looking long term, I'm thinking, you've already had a lollipop today <laughs> and you probably shouldn't get used to having two lollipops a day because you're going to be a 30-year-old and you're going to be like, you know, looking for candy every every hour. So it's just the whole idea all the way through like how they relate to people. How do they have responsibility? Do they approach life with joy and curiosity or are they worried? Are they anxious? And just think like, how can I help them long term, you know, be as healthy as possible? And a lot of times what it means is we put in the short term works, so what I've really seen, and it kind of goes with the phones, like we made that short term hit of saying, okay, yeah, we're going to be that weird family that we don't have video games in the house. We're going we're gonna to be those weird people that like, yeah, we, we understand this is very strange. We're going to take that short-term hit of being weird. But then long-term, we're going to have kids that have fully developed brains, that their prefrontal cortexes work, that they can be in a situation and not have to be addicted to Wi-Fi. They know how to talk to someone, you know, just like sitting, you know, if they're sitting on a train, like they'll talk to the person next to them and, and make a friend instead of just not, you know, being mortified, like to talk to anyone. So just kind of think instead of that short-term amusement, entertainment, relief, escape, think long-term, what do I want? And if you will bite the bullet short-term, like right now, you will reap the rewards long-term. Mm -hmm. Like, so we were a little bit made those decisions to be different, but I'm telling you all the things that people are battling right now with their teenagers, with they're on TikTok too much, they're on Fortnite too much, they're battling depression, they have you know body image issues. Like there's so much that you are grappling with that we do not grapple with because we took that short term, like the immediate ouch, but then have this long term, really amazing benefit. So think long term. Don't be afraid to put the work in. And if you look around and you're the only one doing it, it's okay because as you look around, statistically, like two out of three college kids are lonely. That means our kids are going to grow up to be lonely in college, two out of three. And so the norm is not working. So don't be afraid to not be normal 
perfectly imperfect. Like, don't be afraid to be not normal because that is a really, really great thing. And I love to say, and I'm almost done. I know you've hot, you've hit my hot button here. <laughs> that think of it like college. That is so. Think of us as moms and dads. If we were with one thousand other moms and dads who are raising kids the exact same age as our kids, a thousand of them, don't you think we'd be able to make a friend? You know, and so here's college, and it's all these kids, the same age, the same stage of life. They're trying to figure out, like, what kind of career do I want? What values do I have? You know, they're all in the same boat. And if they cannot find each other and befriend each other, you know, it just shows, like, wow, that's amazing. Like, where else than in college will you have the opportunity to make these lifelong friends because there's so many people to choose from in your station? Mm. Yeah. And there's an epidemic of loneliness because yeah. we don't know how to communicate with each other. Right. Yeah. And that will continue to move into all their relationships, including their marriage, yes. which yeah. is one thing we'll talk about today is how the next generation is viewing marriage and all the effects that yeah. technology and things have on marriage. And what a lovely inoculation against loneliness to be together with this person for the rest of your life. Like it's yeah. a, a beautiful way to say, you know, um, I, I will I will notice you. I will know you or exist because I'm your spouse. Yeah. I'm your person through and through, yeah. no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move on to marriage a little bit then. Um, I always like to take a pause and make sure we talk about marriages on this podcast. Because yeah. even though we're a parenting podcast, your marriage is the foundation of your family. And it's really easy to overlook it when we're in the throes of parenting because we are very busy. Very, very busy. So Tell us a little bit about your story. Like, how did you get to the place where you're talking about marriage and parenting? And then what has helped you keep your focus on your marriage as you've been raising kids? Such a good question. So my second book was 31 Days to a Happy Husband, which my husband was very happy that I was writing this, you know? So this is probably (laughs) at least 10 years ago. We've been married 25 years. And so what I did was I interviewed 31 men. Um, and ask them, like, what is it that your wife does to make you happy? Like, what do you really enjoy? What does she do? And I asked people like Pastor David Jeremiah and comedian Tim Hawkins and counselors and all sorts of any people, Kevin Sorbo, the actor. And it was just a fun project. So a lot of that came out of the idea of, hey, I've got these small children and all I do is take care of my children. And of course, you used to just dote on your husband, right? He was like your main person and you were like, oh, hi, he's home. Yay. You know, like it's the weekend. What do you want to do, sweetheart? Oh, you want to go do this? I'll do that with you. You know, so we move from this spot of like, you're my person to like, oh, I have all these little people to take care of. And I have like multiple of them. And (laughs) you're a full fledged adult. So you can take care of yourself. So you go take care of yourself. And I will take care of these children and all that like, oh, that's all done with the husband. It all goes to the kids. And so out of that context, I was like, you know what, what would happen if I wrote a marriage book? And what would happen if I encouraged women to take 31 days to say, you know what, your husband's been kind of leftovers. He's been like back burner. Like, what if you took 31 days and we're like, you know what? I used to dream about you. I used to stay up at the light at night talking to you on the phone, or I used to do these things. And I used to like, my heart would flutter when you came in. So how can we, you know, you're not going to live in that perpetual state, but how can we appreciate you? How can we be grateful for you? How can we notice you again? So those kinds of things. And that's especially so needed when you have small children because Mm -hmm. obviously you're running so thin. But guess what? If you do those small practices with even when you have little kids, then has so many benefits because as your kids grow, you're still close to your spouse. It's not like, oh, the empty nest nightmare, right? When the kids leave and then the glue is gone and then the two people look at each other and they're like, we have not had a decent conversation in 10 years. What in the world are we going to do? You know, you want to prevent that. So you want to keep connecting with your spouse, even though you have kids with you. And so uh, in National Marriage Week, one of the rhythms that we talk about is connect daily, date weekly and get away regularly. 
So for us, like that daily connection point, you know, you see when we were dating, my my then boyfriend James would be like, oh, let me rub your feet for you. And I'm like, why would I want you to touch my feet? <laughs> like, I was like, that is disgusting. Like, first, I don't like that. And we've just been out for three hours. Like, why would I want you to touch my feet? And it took me a long time to realize, oh, your love language is touch. And you want me to ask you, let me rub your feet. So it's kind of this joke. So our daily connection through the years has been at the end of the day, like I'll rub his feet on the bed and then we'll talk because I like words and he likes touch. So it's just this daily connection. You know, it doesn't have to take a long time. It's like five minutes, like what happened today? You know, what, what happened with the kids? What's going on with this? You know, it's very, we try to keep it very pleasant because it's before you go to bed, but there's a daily connection point and then date weekly. I love to tell people shoot for the weekly date and you'll probably get once a month or twice a month and that will be great. And that's just, you keep courting each other and you have something to look forward to. Like someone's going to make my meal. This is great. I mean, it could be in and out. It could be like, you know, your favorite burger place. It doesn't have to be fancy, but have this date where, and in and out, that's a West Coast chain. It's really good hamburgers. But you have this moment where you're dating weekly. You, there's novelty. They're there. You're trying to awaken curiosity again and, and you're infusing that. And again, on, on marriageweek.org, there's all these date night ideas. And then get away regularly, like once a year. If you can go somewhere, like in an airplane, like sure, do that. But if you can't, just get in your car and drive 30 minutes away. And there's probably some kind of nice place that you can visit and spend 24 hours with your spouse. Your baby will not remember. Your two-year-old will not remember. Your five-year-old will probably not remember, but your spouse will remember. And it's it's the best thing you can do. And honestly, right, for your kids, then for them to see a strong and happy marriage, that gives them stability. And then out of that stability of love and like, my parents aren't going anywhere and my parents actually like each other. Out of that stability, guess what? They get to explore the world. It's like they are sufficiently anchored and then they can go out and explore other things. But at home, if they feel tension or coldness or eggshells or my parents aren't very warm together, then they're like kind of concerned, like what's going on there? And it, and it, and it hinders them. So really by us being stable parents. And so through the years, so we've been married 25 years, through the years, of course, this has ebbed and flowed. I think a lot of it, you asked about like what has made this work. I think the biggest thing is commitment that you have just made a decision. Like there is basically like, I, I love the idea of making the decision. Like I will never do anything or become anyone that will make you have to leave me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to work on me to make sure that I'm always like honorable before God, that I'm going to fulfill my commit, my vows, the vows I made on my wedding day, like I will keep those. And as far as I'm concerned, I will not do anything that will be so bad that you will have to leave me right now. Obviously, we're still going to annoy each other with the toothpaste and you park the car wrong. And why do you want to eat Chinese food when I want to eat Italian food? You know, so all those things are happening, but those are not, I, those are not ways to break up. So really, it is a commitment that says, you know, divorce is not on the table. Separation is not on the table. Like we're going to make this commitment to each other. So is, there is this like decision, like a pre decision that that's, that's going to happen. And then obviously you can't just put that on autopilot. And then it's, I think a big thing has been listening. So if the other person says, I need this, you know, our defense mechanism, like let's pretend my husband says, I need a home cooked meal. Let's say he says that, right? And I would think like, uh, hi, I have three children and I work from home and there's no way I can, you know, so that's kind of how we respond. But listening to like, okay, wait, let's see, this seems to really mean a lot to him. So let me at least just listen and be like, okay, I'm understanding you would like a home cooked meal. Why don't we shoot for one? And this is all, this is just an example, but why don't we shoot for a home cooked meal on Thursday nights? And, and I will do that. So you're, yes, you're making a sacrifice because you're like, okay, I'm busy, whatever, but I'm going to do this. And then it, what does it do? It shows your spouse like, oh, if I, if I express my need, they will try to understand me and they'll try to meet me. And you're doing the same thing. And, you know, and so for me, it'd be like, oh, your tone, I need you to say that, like what you're saying is fine, but the tone is completely off-putting. So I'm asking you, please re-say that <laughs> in a nicer way. And the next time you want me to do that or, to you know, please, you know, so you're, it's give and take, you're both doing it, but it is an atmosphere of it's okay to talk about these things. We have this big joke that when we were dating, James said to me, there's something I want to ask you, but I'm not sure how to say it. 
And I was like, oh my word, I wonder if he's going to propose. Like, I was like, oh my word, what is he doing? And I'm like, you can say anything to me, baby, because that's what we say when we're in love. You can say anything, baby. And he said to me, Steph, no joke, you have this hair on your lip. And I'm wondering if you've ever considered electrolysis. <laughs> he said that to me. Stop. <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> so I was like, um, and I like covered up my mouth and I was like, I I really had not thought about that before, but I thank you. And look at the time. I have to study. We were in grad school. I was like, I have to study. I got to go. And I went to the mirror and I looked and all of a sudden those little teeny hairs that I'd never thought a thing of, I was like, oh my word, I guess I have hair on, on my lip. I've just really never thought of that. And we're old. So I had to look up the yellow pages, uh, which some of you guys will have to Google, but you look up at the yellow pages and it was like laser, 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 electrolysis, electrolysis. And I found a little place and I zapped my little hairs off and it wasn't World War III. We did not break up. I was like, yeah, I guess I do have hairs on my lips. And, it, and so it was so funny because obviously people are like, oh my word, how could he say that? That's so rude. I can't believe it. And his thinking was, if I'm going to someday marry this girl, I'm going to have to be able to talk about the hair on her lip. Like, I'm going to have to be able to say this because we're going to be talking about children and money and where are we going to live and all these things. So it was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to venture out. And so it's such a funny joke for us now, but that the heart of what it is, is you can really tell me anything and mm -hmm. I will not freak out. And, and it goes both ways. Yeah. And but like the hard conversations, it's awkward at first. Yeah. To have, and I think even we've been married a while. I mean, we've been married almost 15 years. Yeah. And I still think yes. that the hard conversations can be awkward. Yeah. But you just make the commitment to doing it. Yeah. That it will just to. happen, that we're just yeah. going to do this. And even preface it like, this is going to be really awkward. Like, literally say that. Like, I feel, I'm pretty sure this is going to be very awkward. I'm going to do the best to say what I need to say. And just please give me grace and forgive me if it comes out all weird and let's try. Yeah. Right. And then it's like, and you're both like, okay, let's, let's try to have this conversation. Yeah. There's one, um, it was don't make the big things small and mm -hmm. don't make the small things big. Yeah. And I really like that. Like you don't have to freak out about all these small things. They're not a big deal. But if you really have a big thing that's going to matter two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you can't put that, you can't just keep putting that away. You've got to talk about that. Yeah. Even when it's uncomfortable. So you guys all know how busy weeknights can be. We in our house are in that stage of parenting where our kids' activities keep us really busy, but no one's driving yet. So my husband and I are in the car a lot. Between that and homework and full-time jobs, it's hard to do the meal prep that I would ideally love to do. And this is why Factor Meals have been an absolute game changer for us. We have Factor Meals delivered every week, and I have one every day for lunch and sometimes for dinner too. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. You can choose from a weekly menu of 35 different options, including things like calorie smart, keto, protein plus, or there are vegan and vegetarian options too. There are also more than 60 add-ons every week, like breakfast, on the go lunch, snacks, and beverages to help you stay fueled and feel good all day long, even when you're too busy to cook. It's completely customizable, so you can pause or reschedule deliveries to suit your schedule. Seriously, you do not want to miss this deal. You can head to factormeals.com slash cppodcast50 and use the code cppodcast50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That's code cppodcast50 at factormeals.com slash cppodcast to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. What are you, so as you like learned more about marriage, what are some of the statistics saying yes. about the state of marriage. Today. Yeah. And I think it's very important for us in the church because we'll always hear like, oh, our statistic is the same as the other people's statistics. So we're not doing much better. But actually, so they'll look at like anyone with faith, you know, like kind of more nominal. So if you look at someone who goes to church regularly, so not just Christmas and Easter, but regularly, then they have a th like a th like 32% of them will divorce. And so 
we kind of look at that 32% like, oh, see, 32%. But then, you know, like that's 68% that's making it. That's, you know, two thirds are making it. So to realize sometimes we always look at that bad side and we say, oh, see, you can't do it. But look at that. Wait a minute. But two out of three people did do that and it helped. And they had this really crazy study at the University of Texas in San Antonio, where if you pray together every day, so you are a couple that prays together every day, then less than 1% of those couples divorce. So that's kind of crazy. And that's that whole idea of, wow, that's we're close enough that we're praying together. We're close enough that we're seeking God. We're asking actively asking for God's help every single day and that's going to drastically reduce your divorce rate you know so that's that's really really good and the divorce rate is down since 1980 so what they do is they look at the number of newly divorced people per 1000 people so in 1980 it was like 22 people and in 2021 it was 13 people so the divorce rate is down so it'd be 13 out of 1000 newly divorced but the marriage rate is also down so it could be, you know, just people are less married and then there's less divorce. And so those, that number I think is what we as parents should really pay attention to is that the marriage rate has fallen so far. We are not repopulating. You've probably heard about the fertility rate that, you know, we have this 2.1 is the, is the replacement rate that we are going to replace ourselves as a civilization. And we're at a record low of 1.6. So it's really like, wow, this is kind of crazy. And with this marriage rate, what they're predicting, because it's fallen 65% since 1970. And what they're predicting, what it means is that one in three young people will not marry, will never marry, one in three. So that's a very, that's the biggest number that they have forecasted in a long time. And what it what it means is, you know, and you can see it, right? In a 20-year-old, in a 30, like, oh, you don't need to get married. Like, let's have a career. Let's be free of that ball and chain. Like that childbearing thing, that looks really hard than ch- taking care of the children. That looks really hard. So that's what we're being fed in social media, what celebrities are saying, like, why would you want this? And so kids have this in their minds. And But then you think, okay, let's play that forward. Now you're 40, 50, 60, 70. You don't have a spouse. You don't have any kin. You don't have any children. Maybe your brothers and sisters, they might not have children. So you don't have a niece and a nephew. And wow, it's like that is going to be so lonely not to have anyone below you, like no one there. And so I think for us as parents, we need to model, like this is something really beautiful that you would want to have. Like you would want to have a person in your life to love you like this all the way through your life until death. Like what a beautiful gift to have someone who will journey with you toward heaven together on this earth and and won't leave you. Like that's a beautiful thing. And if you're single mom, single dad listening, like kudos to you, you've heard, listen, this far. And then for you to be able to pass on this idea that, that marriage as it was created and intended is a good and positive thing. It's it's good for families. It's good for society. And, and that God can redeem any story. He can redeem like right where you're at and, and use it for good. And so for us just to, to be, I think that's what National Marriage Week is about. You know, it's every year, February 7th to 14th, but those tools are there all year long at marriageweek.org to be able to build up your marriage because we want people to have healthier marriages so that kids behind you say, well, you know, Steph is so happy that Miss Steph, she's so happy with her husband and with her kids. I want to someday grow up to be like that. That's what we want to model this. And in order to model it, it's got to be obviously authentic and something that we're experiencing in our own life. I'm curious, do you know, and maybe you don't know, but do you know the statistics of the people who are choosing not to get married? Are a lot of them just cohabitating and having like partnerships or people just being choosing singleness? Yeah. Or a little, probably I both, don't, right? Yeah, I don't have like a solid one on that, but cohabitation is definitely up. Like in the statistics, they'll show like through the decades that cohabiting is becoming more and more popular as it's more accepted, even in Christian circles, right? That you see like a lot of people, they're like, oh, they're just living together. But they also show, you know, statistically, they will do better if they marry 
they will stay together longer than if they cohabit, which kind of makes sense. And so the the because cohabitation obviously is is more like a hey, as long as you scratch my back and you know everything's good and you're good for me, then I'll stick around. And when it stops being good for me, then I'm not going to stick around. And marriage is like no matter what I, what you do, man, you're stuck with me. <laughs> like I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. So yeah. How are you talking to your kids about marriage? Because your kids yeah. are getting older. Too. Yes. Like you have one out of the house, so That's you're right. getting closer to yes. that time. So how are you talking to them about marriage, especially as a Christian, with yeah. these statistics where marriage just isn't as valued? I just, you yes. know, like it's, it's changing the way we view marriage. I think a huge chunk of it is modeling. Like they see like, oh, you are married. You have children. You are, you know, I, I'd like that someday. I've heard both of my girls who are in high school, both of them have said, I, I want it. I'm really excited. Like they've literally said, I'm excited to get married and to have children. So where does this come from? And my son, Ethan, you know, he wants to get married someday, have children, all those things. So I will say like, proactively. There's a book by Dan Chun. He's a pastor and it's called How to Pick a Spouse. And it's really good. So what I do is like for Ethan, I didn't make him read the whole thing because it's kind of, you know, like he might not read the whole thing. But what we did is we would go to lunch. And then when we went to lunch, I we would take one chapter and we kind of pick out like the main questions or main thoughts about the chapter. And so that's how we are talking about marriage. So there are, I think there are very proactive, like really specific words that you're using, like, because kids don't know, how are they supposed to know? Like who to look for? Or, like what's important? What's not important? So we're talking about values. We're talking about money. We're talking about child raising. We're talking about conflict. So it is, and a book does help you guide through those ideas. So that's like more formal, like on purpose, but just a few times, you know, like we've probably yeah. had five lunches it, it like that going through the book. And then we continue, like he's in college now. So when he's home, I'll be like, okay, let's go out to, to lunch. And we went to Indian food and we did one of the chapters, you know, and it was about write down like your ideal woman, like what would she be like? And then kind of go through it and, and see like, what are those essentials? Like the things like I really would like, but the others are just like fluff. And then we kind of talk about it. We talk about how daddy and I picked each other and those kinds of things. And it is super helpful. So I think the formal talking where you're really doing on a purpose, there is certainly a place for that. And I will do that. So we do that with our kids, like when they're a senior in high school, you know, so in terms of like kind of that formal, let's, let's really talk about that on purpose. Um, and then, you know, it's questions, you know, that you're asking, like, oh, you, you're, you know, your, your friend who's a freshman, she's dating someone, what do you think about that? And then we talk about it or this, and it's really been interesting, because we never, we kind of the way we did it is we said, when you date, it's to marry. Like that's the that's the idea of you're just trying to find someone like, oh, this would be someone suitable for marriage. And if you're dating someone and you realize I would never marry this person, that's probably, that's not good. But it's not so serious. Like, oh, if we, I date him, like I must have to marry. No, you're trying to figure this out. Like you're just finding out like, who do you like? Who don't you like? Et cetera, et cetera. And then we've said, you know, that's probably best in college where you're just a little smarter and you just have a little more experience under your belt. So that's kind of what we recommend. But if you want to go like on a group date when you're in high school or whatever. And so it's kind of turned out where with the, all of our kids, A, they never really found anyone. They, they were public school. They never really found anybody so far. I still have a freshman, but so far that's like, wow, that person has really wowed me. So they've, they, so they haven't been tempted by the wow person. Um, but they've also seen, you know, that it takes a lot of time. Like, that's a big thing that they say is like my friend who has a boyfriend, like that's all she does. Like she doesn't do anything else. She just talks to him. So I don't have time for that. They'll say, <laughs> you know, so, so we were talking through dating, talk, make it like something that you do talk about. And, and I think it's important. That's the beauty of the church is that your, your kids, should be in community meeting other people, other couples, other friends that the parents of of their friends, and they should know them. And then they see them and they think, well, I would like to emulate that. Like, like I want that. So I think the modeling is super important, being available to answer questions and then introducing them to other married people. Yeah. I love that you say that about the community too. We have people in our lives who our kids have known since, I mean, they were born. A lot yes. of them have kids yes. the same age. So they've grown up with these other couples and they see their marriages and we just do life with them. And I think that it's just one more example of just like a healthy marriage that yes. they want to be a part of. You know, like yeah. they see it and they're like, well, that looks good. Not perfect, yeah. but good, yeah. you know? Yeah. And my and kids love hearing stories. They like asking us about 
when we were dating and when, how daddy proposed and what our wedding day was like. I just think like they just love hearing stories about Isn't that. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, it's yeah. so sweet. And yeah. it's so fun. And sometimes we'll tell funny stories about like, well, this is when this happened. Yeah. And those <laughs> are the best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what is some like just final encouragement to busy parents who just want to like look to strengthen their marriage? Like maybe yeah. they're just feeling a little too busy. How are they going to get, you talked about the daily connection, the weekly dates, the getaways. We, Trevor and I just went on a getaway for the first time in five years. And we Good were like, you. why? Don't we do this more often? Like we and, and was it was it like wow? This is really good that we did this. It was amazing. Like we came back and we're like, we need to do. We don't need to do like extravagant or like super long every year, yeah. but we need to do something every year. And yeah, we used to do a very very rhythmic date night weekly, and we don't do that as much anymore because our kids are busier. But we. Trevor works from home twice a week, and I always work from home. So like we we take the dog on a walk every yeah. day that he's home, and it's just. A connecting thing. I mean, that yes. can be a date. It doesn't have to be going. We'll go to lunch very often yeah. too. Yes. So like during the day, it's in the middle of the day. And sometimes I think we think of a evening date and that can get hard. Yep. Like we do a middle of the day date more often than not. And that totally and it works. works. Yeah. It yeah. works for our schedule. It doesn't stress us out. We don't have to find a babysitter because our kids are in school. So I think there's a lot of ideas out there, but sometimes we get stuck because we just look at what our limitations are. Yes. With a lack of resources yes. or babysitters. So what are some things that people can do? What are some resources? Give us a little bit of encouragement. Yes. So in my book, 31 Days to a Happy Husband, I interviewed Cliff and Joyce Penner. They're the sex therapists, sex escorts, and my husband was so happy that I was interviewing them. But they talked about the daily kiss. They talked about like a five to 30 second kiss that just says, I still like you. I'm attracted to you. I love you. It's kind of like keeping the pilot light on is how they described it. And I always laughed because we would say to moms, like, we don't want to do that because then he's going to think like strange thoughts and we don't want him to think strange thoughts. So we've talked about how like you could tell your husband, I'm doing this little experiment. I just want to kiss you more often to be close to you, but just don't get the strange thoughts every time that I kiss you <laughs> once in a while. This may lead to something like that, but that's not what I'm saying. But it is is this idea of right that we we do tend to stop showing physical affection because we're so busy and on the go and that's free and it's pretty easy actually and if you just go the 5 seconds like that's super short right and so there are seasons in our life we haven't done it for a while where my husband would literally put a chart on the on the refrigerator and we'd put an x for every day that we did a kiss and we we're trying to get like a big streak and it was really funny because we were you know you remember how we talked about how we were different we're always doing these strange things so my kids just assume they must be doing some strange thing and one day um, my daughter she was in elementary school probably was like what's the chart for and i didn't have a good lie like handy <laughs> and i was like oh this mommy and daddy's kissing chart <laughs> <laughs> like we mark it when we kiss. So, I mean, it's so silly, but honestly, like, can you imagine what it would do in your marriage if you decided like, oh yeah, every day we're going to kiss for five seconds and you totally get out of rhythm. Like right now, my husband has a sore throat. We haven't done this for a long time. So you get out of rhythm. Like we don't do that. And then you have to realize, oh, I got to get back to that. I was sitting um, in behind a couple at church this Sunday and they're probably in their 60s. And they're so sweet together. Like w during the announcements, you can tell they whisper to each other and they like kind of giggle and they still have that gleam in their eye and they like lean into each other. And I'm just like, I need to do that more. Like I'm not really like that, so, you know? So it's – so. I think seeing things sometimes like that sweetness and thinking that just takes me a second, but it is the idea of I want to be considerate. I want to show love. And John Gottman, who did all the marriage research, what he talks about is the important quality is that you pay attention to your spouse. Mm. So he talked when he's interviewing these couples, there was one couple and he was talking about how he all, he like witnessed a coup in another nation when he was traveling abroad. And he's telling this amazing story. And the wife is like completely bored, like zoned out, not even listening to him. And then another couple, he was sharing just how his mother would make bread. And the woman was just like, oh, that's amazing. Like so entranced. So it was in 
how you listen to your spouse. How do you respond to your spouse? So I try to remind myself of that picture of when my husband is saying something like, how can I be interested in, in what you are saying? And notice these are not things that you have to purchase. They don't really take you extra time because you're standing there anyway, but it's the whole demeanor that I, I am interested and I will respond as best that I can to you. Yeah. Because you probably did once upon a time. Yeah, exactly. You did a you whole know. lot of it at the beginning. <laughs> We're yeah. all experts in this. We just got to dust it off. That's right. Yeah. I just think that's a good reminder, though, because we do. We get into our rhythms. We get into our habits. And that yes. involves a lot of separation. Yeah. Really. I mean, between jobs and parenting and chores, it's just a lot of separation. So it, it takes intentionality to come together and make sure that you're loving that person in a way that's yeah. meaningful to them. And that looks different for every couple, obviously. So I think paying attention yes. is just a great place to start. Yes. And it's so simple. So that would be, that's the challenge for the week. Pay attention to your spouse. And you might want to make a kissing chart. Who knows? You might want to make a kissing chart. <laughs> a lot of it, it all depends on like if it's cold season or not. But it's like, but, but I mean, make, make the chart at some point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here and for just fighting for marriages and talking about marriages. Can you just um, let us know how to connect with you and then where to find some of these resources? And I can link anything in yes. show notes too. Yeah, marriageweek.org is where you're going to find a couple's connection plan about the love languages, kind of you're on the date. Now, what in the world do you do? What do you talk about? There's a date night, you know, all creative date nights and all sorts of research and, and help for marriages. So that's all at marriageweek.org. And then I have a weekly podcast called The Happy Home. So you could certainly um, check that out. And then I have a book, uh, 31 Days to a Happy Husband. I have a master class that goes with that. So that we, if you like to kind of, we can keep talking video wise is a fun way to do that. And that's at happyhomeuniversity.com. And on happyhomeuniversity.com, you'll also find a free documentary of my kids talking about what it's like to grow up without social media and phones mm -hmm. and video games and all that. So you can watch that and then you can make your kids watch it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's kind of a fun. And if you're like the mean mom, the mean dad, you can be like, oh, look, this is someone who's even meaner than you than we are. So, hey, we, we want to be your scapegoat. So head on over. You're not alone in any of those challenges. You're not alone. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Steph. Thank you so much for listening to the Christian Parenting Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you love this podcast, would you please consider leaving a review and sharing it with a friend? This is the best way to reach more people and encourage even more parents. Christian Parenting is a donor-funded ministry, and we rely on friends like you to keep podcasts like this going. So to find out more about Christian Parenting and to make a donation, head over to christianparenting.org or at christianparenting underscore org on Instagram. Thank you again. See you next week. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Corient. Corient provides wealth management services centered around you. They focus on exceeding your expectations and simplifying your life. Corient has been helping high achievers just like you enjoy their lives more fully, preserve their wealth, and provide for the people, causes, and communities they care about. As one of the largest integrated fee-only registered investment advisors in the U.S., Corient has deeply experienced teams in 23 strategic locations. Corient has extensive knowledge spanning the full spectrum of plan investing, lending, and money management disciplines. Leverage Corient's exclusive network of experts to craft custom solutions designed to help you reach your financial goals, no matter how complex they may be. Real wealth requires real solutions. For more information, connect with a wealth advisor today at Corient.com. That's C-O-R-I-E-N-T.com. Corient.com.